Well, Pastor Tucker said the key, a key word for the convention was, was humility that came to him. And <clears throat> I always have this thought that humility is the key to unity. This is the great key. We are told that we are to esteem others better than ourselves and not are preferring others before ourselves. And we find even in the lives of the 12 apostles who were the foundation of the church, that even in their young lives, they were competitive. Even at the last day of the Lord's life, around the communion table, they were arguing who is going to be the greatest. But when their Lord was brutally beaten and crucified, and they forsook him in the garden, there was terrible brokenness in them. Fifty-three days later, on the day of Pentecost, they were all in one accord, and the Holy Spirit was poured out. The Lord is going to move where there is humility, where there is unity. May the Lord help us, all of us, esteem others better than ourselves, preferring others before ourselves. That's the exact opposite of the spirit and thinking of this world. The prince of this world wants to be at the top in control. Well, my main theme today is, are we ready? And God still wants to do a deeper work because the greatest revival and harvest is coming. Are we prepared totally yet? Are we skilled instruments in God's hands? Well, I, in one of the Zoom meetings a few, maybe a year or so ago, I, I had an introduction that I'd like to just repeat again. Often when God is speaking that he's about to move, Everything goes the opposite. And I think one of the greatest examples of this is in Exodus, early chapters, where the Lord met Moses in the burning bush. God's people had been in slavery and in bondage for years. And God said, I've come to set them free. And Moses went and told Aaron, Aaron went and told the elders. The elders told all the people, and they were all excited. God is ready to move and set us free. And so Moses goes to Pharaoh. The Lord said, set my people free. Who is the Lord? <laughs> and what did he do? He imposed even greater bondage and misery persecution, slavery, bondage, and the people were very discouraged. But God was using all of these things to prepare to judge the wicked and to bring forth a tremendous release. So in this time when God is speaking through many prophets that the Lord is getting ready to move, sometimes things seem to be getting a little darker but let's remember this example in Exodus, that here is God speaking, I'm ready to move, and everything gets worse for a while, and then there's a tremendous release. So let's be encouraged. <clears throat> Jesus said in Luke 10, verse 2, the harvest truly is great. The laborers are few. Pray that the Lord of harvest would send forth laborers into his harvest. You know, when we pray according to the will of God, he answers. And this is the will of God to pray that God is going to raise up many harvesters but this thought of the laborers are few doesn't only mean few in number, literally. It means they're not very well equipped. 
And so we want to pray that the Lord will not only raise up many more laborers, but very well equipped with good harvest tools that the Lord wants to give to his people. <clears throat> so remember, God does answer prayers that are prayed in his will. And that's his will. We are to pray that the Lord of harvest will raise up many skilled laborers. And that's the vision of Zion, to go through all the nations and give them good knowledge. Thank you, Lord. So let's talk for a moment about knowledge. In Isaiah 53, 11, it's speaking of Jesus, but there's a certain phrase here I want to dwell on. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many? It takes knowledge. It's the truth that sets people free. In Hosea 4, verse 6, we are told, my people, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. God wants to give a sharper sword, better harvesting tools to us, and to spread this to many other shepherds around the world. Paul prayed for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. You know, ordinary knowledge produces ordinary Christians, but superior knowledge does a far greater thing in people. We need greater knowledge and understanding, all of us. No matter how far we've come, we need greater knowledge. <clears throat> I always have appreciated these verses in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, about not glorying in intellectual or physical strength or in money. But verse 24, Jeremiah 9, 24. This is what God wants us to concentrate on in life. Let him who glories glory in this, that he knows and understands me. He wants a compatible people, a bride, someone conformed to his image, who knows him, who understands him. And then to share that with many other people. Not just superficial knowledge. Today, the church world is filled with very shallow, superficial knowledge. There is very little eternal vision. It's mainly just believe in Jesus and you're in. Oh, no, there's many, many things more that we need to know. We want a better resurrection. We need to overcome in many areas of our life to rule and reign with him. The Lord wants close friends. This is what this creation is all about. Rebellion in heaven. And God later created this temporary earth to develop a people to replace them. 1 Corinthians 6, 3 talks about, do you not know that you will judge angels? We're called in this short life to be overcomers, to have character, and to replace the fallen creatures of heaven. The Lord is not coming for a glorious baby. He's coming for a glorious bride. And many people only hear the message of new birth, and they're fed milk. He's not coming for a glorious baby, but a glorious bride. Someone who knows him and understands him, conform to his image. <clears throat> we remember the three degrees of spiritual growth in 1 John chapter 2, verse 12 to 14. Little children, young men, and fathers. In the natural, a little child, let's say he's a five-year-old, well, young man who's 25, 
is quite a lot different from a five-year-old. And then you get someone who's 80 years old, like Brother Bailey, who's had years of learning and wisdom. Little children, young men and fathers, God wants us to grow from baby stage into maturity, who knows him, who understands him, and can bring that knowledge to many other people. The Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 to 3, Paul calls them babies, carnal. They'd been saved for maybe four years, filled with the Holy Spirit. And Paul said, you're still babies, you're carnal. So I'm going to read the 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 to 3. <clears throat> and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babies in Christ. I have fed you with milk, not with meat. For here too you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For you are yet carnal, whereas there is among you envying, strife, division. Are you not yet carnal and walk as natural men? Today the church world basically is very immature babies. And God wants his people. Listen, the Lord could not come back today because he's coming for a glorious bride without spot or blemish. He cannot come today. Today, the church is far from that. It's more like the Corinthian church. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> we're looking for tremendous miracles and signs and wonders. Pastor Bailey even saw in a vision that God was going to even renew youth somewhat. I think some of us older folks could appreciate that. <laughs> I look forward to a new body someday, too. <clears throat> so the fear of the Lord is going to fall, which is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. So let's be more and more ready for what God wants to do. We would like to be very, a very good part of this coming revival. We want to be part of it. And uh, so we need, even though we do have somewhat greater knowledge, even God wants to even give greater knowledge and understanding. But I want to talk now about something that's a burden on my heart. Because when we look at Scripture... We find many good men in the Bible who were used mightily and then became lax and let down their standards and, and became careless. And we're going to talk about some of them. But for all of us, if God is going to use us to do great miracles, signs and wonders, we want to guard our heart tremendously that we stay humble, dependent. <clears throat> I sometimes think about Catherine Kuhlman. I remember when she passed away in February of 1976. There were a number, several million people who were healed and blessed under her ministry. But she had a certain ability about her to deflect glory and attention away from herself. And I've always appreciated that. And she would say, I have absolutely no power more than any other human being to heal anyone. I am simply connecting their faith with God. But she would deflect all attention away from herself. And that's something we want, especially when we're used mightily by God, just to be hidden behind the cross. God is about to do miracles that we've never thought of before, and we want to remain very humble. We read in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, where Jesus is warning many who performed great works in his name who didn't even make it to heaven. And they thought that doing these great miracles excused letting iniquity go on in their life. So let's read 
Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Now, this is a picture of the judgment seat of Christ. You know, the Father doesn't judge any man. He's committed all judgment to the Son. Everyone will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And here is a day of judgment. Listen to this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father that's in heaven. Many. Many. We heard that word last night. Many, many. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we've prophesied in your name. In your name, we've cast out demons. In your name, we've done all these wonderful miracles and works. And people sometimes think because they have a tremendous ministry that God is excusing sin. And the Lord has to say to them, sadly, I never approved of you. Depart from me, you who continually practice lawlessness. I remember Pastor Bailey sharing a story about in another country, he was in a large church of seven, several thousand. And the pastor was having affairs with about six other ladies in the congregation. But here he is, a big growing church. And whatever. But in his own private life, he's having affairs with different... And he's thinking, because I have this huge church, and maybe even God was doing miracles and things, that God is excusing it. What a deception. And the Lord is making it very clear that here are people who are born again and spirit-filled, casting out demons, doing wonderful works in his name preaching the gospel, and God has to say to them on the day of judgment, depart from me, you who continually practice lawlessness. May the fear of the Lord be with all of us. Great works do not excuse living in sin. So there is a great danger when God uses people to do a lot of mighty works. So I'd like to give some examples. And Paul makes this very clear that all these things are written for our learning, for our warning, not to do the same things. When we think of Samson, when we think even of King David, who conquered Zion and later was in adultery and murder, King Hezekiah, Solomon, Uzziah, different other people, Actually, there were very few people in the Bible that God used mightily who remained faithful. Maybe Josiah, Joseph of Genesis, but very few that were not injured when they did tremendous things for God. Well, when we think of Samson, we read of him in, in Judges chapter 14 to 16, he could slay a thousand Philistines having this long jawbone of a donkey. What an instrument. But it's spiritually, you know, God uses strange instruments sometimes. Here he could slay a thousand Philistines. One day he was attacked by a lion, that poor lion. <laughs> and he tore him to pieces. Well, one night he was in a certain city surrounded by enemies and he's having an affair with a harlot. This is Judges 16, verse 1. And what does he do? In the dark of the night, he goes out to the gates and he pulls them out of their foundations. This might have been several thousand pounds. And he runs with them 25 miles. I don't think any Olympic man has ever done that before. But he was becoming very careless in his life. Well, in Judges 16, verse 4, he comes to another harlot named Delilah who seduces him. And one night she said, 
the Philistines are out there to get you. They're surrounding you. And he just thinks, oh, I'll go out as other times. So we read in Judges 16, verse 20, wake up for the Philistines are here to get you. And he says in verse 20, uh, I'll just go out as other times. But he didn't realize that the spirit of God had departed from him. This is a man with a tremendous anointing, used tremendously, who's become careless. And we know the story, the end of Dear Samson. So the Apostle Paul tells us that all these things are written for our learning, for our warning. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. All these things happen to them for our examples. They are written for our admonition. Again, why am I saying these things? Because we're at the end of the age and God is going to do phenomenal things. And I believe God wants to use us to do tremendous miracles, signs and wonders. And that's when we have to be extremely careful to be hidden behind the cross. You know, even the Apostle Paul said this. He had a holy fear that after he preached to many, that he himself would be, not be a castaway, a rejection, re rejected. <clears throat> so I'd like to read 1 Corinthians 9, 27. I keep my body under and bring it to subjection, lest I by any means, after when I've preached to many others, I myself should be a castaway or rejected. Do you remember when the Lord allowed a thorn in his life? It was very uncomfortable. And he pleaded three times, Lord, please remove this thorn. And God said, you need it. I can't. Or you'll be exalted above measure. And so sometimes God does leave a thorn in our life, especially when we're being used mightily to keep us humble, dependent. Then King David here is the man of whom it was said, I have found me a man after my own heart who is going to accomplish all my will. Writing th 75 of the Psalms. A wonderful man conquering Mount Zion. Bringing us to Zion. But I want to read a particular verse. 2 Samuel 7 verse 1. And this is a very, very dangerous verse. You know, I preached a sermon one time called The Dangers of Prosperity, and no one looked at it because they saw the title. <clears throat> People don't want to hear a message like that. But listen to this. 2 Samuel 7, 1. It came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies. I want to say it again. This was the most dangerous time in his whole life. Far more dangerous than when he stood before Goliath or all these other things because he was letting down. So what happens? He starts having affairs with Bathsheba. Then she's, she's expecting. And oh, I've got to cover this up. So he arranges for her husband to be at the front lines of, of a battle and then for the other men to go get away from him. And he's killed. So here, this most wonderful man who brought us to Zion. Now God has delivered him from all his enemies, and now he's becoming careless in adultery, even allowing an innocent man to die, and then covering it up with rationalizations. Of course, later he had deep repentance, and he'll be in the millennium. But, but isn't it incredible that even when he's in the millennium, <laughs> This Bible still has to be read of what he did. <laughs> but as like Pastor Bailey said, after the millennium, he believes that a lot of these things will be forgotten. But <clears throat> isn't that incredible? Most wonderful King David, a man after God's own heart, 
later becoming an adulterer, a murderer, and hypocrisy, but from success, but deep repentance later. And he has psalms of repentance too, deep repentance. The most dangerous time in all his life was when God had delivered him from all his enemies and given him rest round about. So we need to beware of the dangers of prosperity. Now, God wants to use us to our maximum, and I want to be used to my maximum, but God knows my limits, and I don't want to go one inch further. I want to be kept on course. I don't want to disgrace the Lord or injure one single human being. I want to read Jeremiah 22, verse 21. I spoke unto you in your prosperity, but you said I will not hear. Prosperity makes people not listen. I've never heard a prosperity preacher quote this verse ever. <laughs> and Paul prayed three times, Lord, remove this thorn. And God said in his mercy, I can't lest you be exalted above measure. I always remember the story in Catherine Kuhlman's life story book of this young woman who was totally paralyzed. She had no hope. She wasn't wheeled in in a wheelchair. She was brought in on a whatever you call it, a stretcher. And God instantly healed her. And here she was with a new beginning. But the story is this, and she didn't even want it in her book at first. What did she do with her new body? Well, first of all, she left her husband and started having affairs with all kinds of men. Do you see this? We have to warn people that when they're healed, when God blesses them to beware, to use their new body and their new health for God and not go their own way. We have to warn people of that. In this coming revival, I've never forgotten that story. In Galatians 5, 13, God warns us not to use our liberty for the flesh. Liberty can be dangerous. Sometimes we need thorns in our life to keep us on course. And we remember, of course, this, the story of the ten lepers. In Luke 17, verse 12 to 18. Ten lepers who had absolutely no hope of a future, just like dying with cancer. God heals all ten of them. Only one returned to give glory to the Lord. The other ten went their own way with their new bodies. Oh God, we need to warn people that when God gives you your miracle, Use your health, your blessing for him. Are we ready for our miracle? Hezekiah was another example. He was unblemished in 2 Kings 18, verse 3. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He brought revival in verse 4 to 17, verse 4 to 7. It says he departed not from following the Lord. And when the king of Assyria came against Jerusalem, he wouldn't yield to him. And the Lord defended, and, and 186,000 of the enemy were dead the next morning. So, but then God said to Hezekiah, set your house in order. I'm going to take you home now. It's time for you to die. And he pleaded that God would extend his life. And God did extend his life 15 years. And what did he do during those 15 years? He blemished his testimony. He was showing all of his secrets to the Babylonians, not knowing that later they were going to come in and get him and destroy the city. So... We read all of this in 2 Kings and also in Chronicles and in Isaiah. 
He even asked for a sign. Lord, show me a sign that you're going to extend my life 15 years. He didn't really believe it. He wanted a sign, and the Lord said, okay, through Isaiah, the son, you want it to go down or go back? And he said, let the son go back. And it did. Can you imagine what a sign that was? That what his word was, God listened to, and even the universe went back with the sun changing its course. But you know, these miracles and things, these next 15 years, he was careless. So we want to be careful. You know, it would be better if Hezekiah had been taken those 15 years earlier, and he would have gone into eternity with an unblemished testimony. If God sees me going off course in the future, I would rather that he took me now. I want to go into heaven with an unblemished testimony by God's mercy. <clears throat> well, maybe I will close with Second Chronicles 26, verse 5. And this is uh, an account of the King Uzziah. And as long as he sought the Lord, as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. But in verse 16, same chapter, verse 16, when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. Again, the warning of success letting down our guard, becoming careless. These were good men, good men. King David, one of the best men, and success caused him to go down. And here was a man who brought us to Zion. He later repented, but you see there's a blemish there. So may we allow the Lord to prepare us for what he's about to do. That when when and if God should use us to do phenomenal miracles or signs or wonders, we be kept humble, dependent, hidden behind the cross in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm speaking to myself and I'm speaking to all of us. Amen. God bless you.